Hello everyone, welcome to a WWE pay-per-view review from the CC Network. I'm Fred, your ever reliable host as always, and today we'll be looking back at SmackDown's Money in the Bank pay-per-view that emanated from the Scott Trade Center, formerly known as the Keel Center, in St. Louis, Missouri last night. Now, Money in the Bank is highly anticipated, and after years of solid shows, it's easy to see why, and even some amazing or great ones along that timeline. But with WWE's stagnating product, could this show revive some interest? Extreme Rules did for Raw, so SmackDown has a lot to do in order to contribute the same effect. Whether they could get it done or not with a meager card is the interesting question. Now, the reuniting hype bros defeated the Colognes on the pre-show, and the usual Money, Money, Money Donald Trump song was used as the theme song as it's been for the last few years. Not much more I need to say, let's get straight into this review. We kick things off with the first ever women's Money in the Bank ladder match, which ended in bemusing and controversial fashion. As Carmella won, thanks to James Ellsworth climbing up that ladder, grabbing the briefcase and dropping it to her on the ground to give the Queen of Saturn Island the opportunity of a lifetime after 13 minutes and 14 seconds. Now, for a match that was defined and hyped to be historic, what a damp squib this turned out to be. Now, I understand some of you may not think so. Some of you say the women's Money in the Bank match was fine. I, however, do not agree with you on that. It had its fleeting moments of hard-hitting action and moves, with uh, the corkscrew tope, the catapult, and, of course, the Hurricane Rana off the ladder being the highlights of that. But it was far too mediated and plodding to make an impact, as they spent most of the match barely even fighting on the ladder going for the briefcase. And as each woman had their own area of momentum and offense, it slowed the pace down, which made their moves and performances feel sloppy and uncoordinated, and made the length of this not justify the contents it had beneath it. Sure, we saw women do moves that WWE would not necessarily allow them to do, so the move variety was going to benefit regardless, because obviously when are you ever going to see a woman hitting another woman with a ladder? Crazy, right? And of course, that aggression and the story of Ellsworth's finish allowed this match to have some bite to it, but outside of a quite decent crowd, it was a match that was defanged actually from the start and lost a lot of its power and momentum and might from the get-go. But the thing is, it was starting to build when the match got to its conclusion. And inevitably, before it got the chance to actually make anything good of itself, it ended so abruptly that it inevitably left me thinking, why the hell couldn't they have just given this 10 more minutes and have it actually develop properly? I mean, sure, some of you may not like the ending. I understand that it's bad, in a way. You've got the first multi-woman ladder match being won by a man. I know that that is a bad thing, but for the story of Carmella's victory and the building of her as a heel at the top of the company on SmackDown in the women's division, she needs that heat. In that regard, it's a bloody stroke of genius that gives this match a chance to shine for the good reasons I've specified and the wrong reasons and the fact that Ellsworth was the one who won this match technically. It's crazy, but inevitably I can see the positive and the negatives of it. However, it does mean that this slow, lifeless match has got a massive asterisk against it. But while many will think that this match had been bolstered with a decent crowd, some nice moves, and a shock swerve of a finish, it did barely enough to escape the doldrums of my rating scale with a one and a quarter star rating. I just couldn't get into this, and as a result, we're left mulling over what might have been as his women, who we know are extremely good wrestlers, should have done more than this. And if only WWE had actually let them take risks and given them time to build this, it could have actually been worth the hype. Also, if Raw had this match, and there's a likelihood they will have it next year, I bet that they will be allowed to do whatever they wanted to make it amazing, give it a lot of time, a lot of aggression, intensity, storytelling, risky moves, and the crowd and the pace would be better, and it'd be all over, and it would just be amazing, wouldn't it? Because Raw has to look strong, but of course, SmackDown tried their hardest, but inevitably they didn't come away looking too great. I know they're good at experimenting and offering new opportunities, but when they needed to, I bet, Raw would be able to make everything good because Vince loves the biggest brand looking good, despite the fact with his efforts, they haven't looked good for nearly a month or two. So joke's on you. Also, another thing. I have to bring up before we go on to the next match. My enjoyment rating, as you can see on screen, is pretty low because seriously, the match didn't really tickle my fancy. But one thing really pissed me off and it's something a lot of you may find insignificant. But for me, it just irked me enough to where I noted it down. Indeed, because ladies and gentlemen, if you're going into a match where you beat someone up with a ladder or in this case, defend yourself from being beaten down with a ladder, 
You do not need to have your faces dressed up and prettified so well for it. Seriously, I saw all five of those women going into that match with so much makeup on, it was distracting. Even with Tamina, an ass kicker. What the hell does she need to go into a ring with full lipstick, eyeshadow and everything else? It doesn't necessarily need to be done at all. You're going in there to bash someone's face in with a ladder. It, why do you need to look good doing it? I don't understand that. And it just made this match feel like an afterthought for me after the first five minutes, because I just couldn't get my head around it. They were trying to hit each other with ladders and cause distraction, yet they had their faces made up so intricately and neatly that it just blew my mind. I'm thinking, okay, what, this match is historic. They want to have good pictures on WWE.com, but seriously, why? I know some would say Gold Dust and Umaga wearing makeup to a match technically defeats my point, but they were wearing makeup for character reasons. Umaga being the Brutus Samoan who has tattooed face paint, which is obviously flawed in its own right, and Gold Dust could not be Gold Dust without the damn gold, could he? That that at least makes sense. Having all five of these women wear makeup which would have sweated off their faces or be punched or beaten off is a massive problem. I, I know you need to make your women look good in aesthetics as well as in ring ability, but come on! In a match like this, it just wasn't needed and it just, it just annoyed me to where this match that was already losing my fancy and annoying me through its lack of ability, really, it had to throw another stone into its proverbial bucket by doing that. And some of you may not even dare to care, but for me, it annoyed me enough to where it actually affected my enjoyment of the match. Most other times, I wouldn't give a damn what makeup they wear in the match. It wouldn't. But when you're in a violent match like this, yeah, it has some problems. I could probably even say the same for the Hell in a Cell match or the violent street fights that Charlotte and Sasha had too, but oh well. We need to get on with the next match, because it's really, really warm here in the UK, and I'm going to be losing a lot of energy before I even reach the end. So let's just keep going and persevere forward. One and a quarter star for the women's money in the bank. It has to get better from here, or we're going to be in some serious trouble. Next up, we have the SmackDown Tag Team Championship match. We saw the New Day defeat the Usos by countout. Yes, two finishes in a row that were not traditional, as the champions walked out following 12 minutes and 20 seconds of action. Now, this match was building to a very exciting conclusion, only for it to end in such a already noted disappointing finish. Now, it was Fast and Furious balancing out with Kofi's beautiful destruction at the hands of the Usos, showing their dominance, as well as Kofi selling so well that I feared for his health at times, especially after that double suplex on the LED post that won a 0.5 on the move variety, along with that dragon sleeper that Kofi put forward. I loved that. Never see a dragon sleeper very much, so inevitably it was all well and good. Not to mention his partners came in tow, it swung momentum, it flowed really nicely, and I loved that. Inevitably though, the cowardly finish came into play and kind of ruined all my good-natured feelings for it, and that's not a good thing. The crowd were into it the longer it went on, fully embracing these teams' chemistry as they delivered a physical contest that made the belts feel like it mattered. If not for the finish, and it had a more decisive and climactic fall sequence, and honestly, a little more time if I'm going to be picky, we could have actually had a three-star match here. We really could have. However, that wasn't to be. I feel it's a two-and-a-half-star match. It's not that bad. It's a very average tag team bout that could have been amazing, but I'm not going to say I'm necessarily unhappy with it. It was very good. If not for, obviously, the bad finish, we'd be looking at something much better. Now, I can't wait to see more from these two. They've got good matches down in the pipeline. You had a few stipulations in there. You had some crazy, authentically violent, crazy stuff, and these guys could put on an absolute clinic. Their next match should be great if this appetizer was anything to go by. Following that, we have the SmackDown Women's Championship match, where Naomi defeated Lana via that awesome submission finisher that I can never remember the name of, which followed a teased cash-in by Carmella that distracted her challenger after 7 minutes and 26 seconds. Now, for Lana's debut main roster match, or if I'm right, her first ever match in a wrestling ring, good god, her performance wasn't too shabby. She was hard-hitting and physical, working Naomi's leg and back throughout. It gave this match some psychology to work with, which was nice, as you can see on my rating scale. However, what you can see on the rating scale there is that everything else flopped. 
She was sloppy in movement and execution of moves. Naomi offered little to proceedings outside of proving she's extremely athletic, which we already know. You don't need to prove that every time. The crowd were dead as well. It was slow as hell and just not enjoyable. I predicted Carmella to win the briefcase just so she could cash in on Naomi and win the title here. And especially after the finish, when Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon both said they would deal with this on SmackDown, you wouldn't think it would be the smart idea for Carmella to cash in that briefcase and get the title before they have any chance to punish her or do any kind of result tampering. I don't know, that would have actually been pretty damn good. I would have liked that and it would have also made her an even bigger heat magnet for every single other woman on the roster, even the bad guys, to want to kill her. Seriously, it would have been great and the women's division is screaming for someone everyone can hate and rally against and that would have been so good. But honestly, this match needed that to even make it worth something and without it, it compounded my misery in watching this utter, utter piss poor contest and I did not like it one bit bit. It was boring and just did nothing for the division overall and proved how slim it is overall. So yeah, they get to zero. I'll give props to Lana for her effort, but that's all this match had. And it's definitely one of the worst pay-per-view matches I've seen this year, and there is no doubt about that. Now, I know this bemused a lot of people seeing the WWE Championship match not main event this show. Remember, it's called Money in the Bank, so logically the eponymous match of this pay-per-view's namesake would main event above it. There's no reason to say that Jinder is a poor champion or WWE's creative team haven't got their priorities right. It's a horrible piece of card structure. I knew they would finish this night off with the money in the bank. It made sense to do so. Don't get your panties in a twist, you unbelievable man-children who think that that's an issue in modern-day wrestling. You know what's an issue in modern-day wrestling? Having the champion come out first. That's a pain in the ass. Good to put that out there. Anyway, speaking of that WWE Championship bout, we saw Jinder Mahal retained by defeating Orton in his hometown, following the Cobra Cut Slam, off of Randy destroying the Singh brothers in another brilliant beatdown, after 20 minutes and 58 seconds. Now, considering their match at Backlash had a lot of depth and quality, it surprised me immensely, and I'm thinking to myself going in, there's no way they can match up to that. They didn't. <laughs> but I'm happy that the psychology managed to match up to that prior match because the rest didn't and without it, it would have floundered more than it looks to have done. Now, seeing Mahal do what I believe many wrestlers should do by focusing on body parts and using their offense and knowledge of a wrestler to weaken them bit by bit for the duration of the match ensured that while the crowd sat on their hands watching Mahal dissect their hometown boy, I was loving the ruthlessness and intensity that Mahal brought to the table, much like I did at the Backlash encounter where he worked the shoulder. He worked the knee this time to limit Orton's speed to great effect. Even though we got beaten down in the opening minutes, it worked in not only limiting the match's pace for good reason, but it made Mahal look strong as Orton sold beautifully for him. And the use of Bob Orton Sr. to get Orton angry to cause him to end up getting distracted and beating up the Singh brothers walking into the finish was nice as the story and psychology made up and made me realize, okay, not only is Mahal a shrewd tactician in the ring, but Orton's temper lost him the title. That means when he get to a rematch at Battleground, it will probably be in a cage or some kind of amazing variety of some steel structure or whatever, and it will inevitably have a lot of meat to it that it's been built up steadily over this time to lock the Singh brothers out to give Orton a chance where his anger can't be a problem. That's good for the story and its final destination. That's great, it helps. However, the rest of the match, like I've highlighted, lacked in a lot of ways. And I've already mentioned the slow pace and the minor crowd noise, as they weren't expecting such a one-sided bout, but neither was I. And while the psychology allowed it to be satisfactory, it made this match feel drawn out and overly long and senseless. Especially when Orton no-sold a giant chunk of the psychology in his late run, dampening even this match's best element. The match went the right length of time, but I would have liked the even contest we saw at Backlash to make it more interesting and to make the hatred run wild because it would have been lovely. Sadly, we didn't get that as the match, while doing better than I expected to after the surprisingly good match last pay-per-view, it wasn't the sleeper hit that I wanted it to be. Now, we did get a superb RKO through the table, decent length and a nice storytelling on there to really carry the match, but you can only carry a match so far. 
Not just in ratings, but also with my patience. I enjoyed it enough, but only to get two stars out of the deal. Now, I'm liking the haul in ring at the moment, and I'm hoping his run continues a bit longer so I can enjoy it. He's improving week on week and could be a contender for my underrated wrestler of the year award come December if his performances keep impressing me. Because unlike most of this roster, he values body psychology enough to make his matches feel good, even if they may not seem like it to most other people. I won't hinder Jinder as he was out and out the winner here, not just for his character, not just for his wrestling ability, but it proves... He isn't going to go down without a fight, and when he inevitably does, he's going to look amazing doing it, and I cannot wait to see that. God, Jinder as champion. I never thought I'd actually like that a month or two down the line, but hey, it's working. Bring on the rest of this summer, because it should be quite entertaining. I am hoping. Let's hope his next opponent, if it's not Orton, proves to be just as competent, because without Orton, Jinder wouldn't be looking as good, but gotta tap my hat to Jinder here. He's impressing me more and more each week, and I cannot wait to see what else we have in store from the modern-day Maharaja. Next up, we have one of my biggest wrestling pet peeves, and it is an unannounced impromptu matchup, everyone, as Breezango finally took on the team who'd been attacking everybody, or so they thought, the Ascension. Yeah, this match would have been better off on a pre-show as they comprehensively won after a quick 3 minute and 50 second match. Now, there's not much that really could be said about this throwaway bout, really. I liked the pace and it had a hard-hitting nature to it, but it was over in the blink of an eye and the reveal of the Ascension was a disappointment. I said on the Twitter that I would have loved it to have been the authors of Pain, because I thought it was, because they looked bulky as hell. Logically, I think they may end up revealing that, and it'll be utterly amazing, leading to a story of redemption for the fashion police as they finally apprehend their guys. Are these guys really their criminals they're looking for? I still don't know, and we may have to wait on SmackDown to find out in the next few weeks. However, as you can tell, this match was a disappointment all round. It did nothing for me, nothing for the crowd, and just really nothing at all. Because unless the Ascension were the criminals they're looking for and it rounded out the story nicely, th <laughs> this match served no purpose and is utterly useless. It's a zero. And I'm annoyed even more because we have two zeros on a card in 2017. This is something unprecedented in modern times, because last year, I rarely even had one on a show, let alone two on one. Good God, it doesn't look good. However, we do have one main event for this show to save itself. So, speaking of which, the winner of the eponymous Money in the Bank ladder match was Bookie's favourite Baron Corbin, who grabbed the push-spawning MacGuffin briefcase after taking Nakamura and Styles off the ladder, after 29 minutes and 50 seconds of pulsating action. Now, considering the talent involved and how flat the opener was, I was expecting this match to deliver where the other didn't. And while it managed to in places, it wasn't the all-in-out barnstormer that I expected. Now, having alliances form and disintegrate, having Nakamura be attacked at the beginning and have his triumphant and loud as hell redemption for it, Zayn's destructive resilience and Nakamura and Styles fighting each other in WWE for the first time made the psychology be quite well pumped up. You would think that, but thanks to a lack of selling after some quite horrific moves, the impact of the psychology was lessened, meaning all of my suspension of disbelief was thrown straight out of the window, limiting my enjoyment as it took its sweet-ass time to speed up and ramp up the risks to make it all worth that. It was so slow in its early going, it just annoyed me immensely. I know you have to try and pace everything and give every single wrestler their chance, just like you did in the first one, but you've got 30 bloody minutes, you can at least ramp it up at the beginning when people show desperation. Oh, oh, Jesus, this... This match annoyed me in a lot of places. Now, the D6 men did do their best to make the briefcase look like it was worth getting as they damn near killed each other off some amazing moves. A deep six to the outside, the sunset flip power off the top, a half Nelson suplex on the apron, a choke slam and an AA to a prop ladder, and of course the Kinshasa from the top made this match feel exciting and fresh while the crowd, that were quiet at its embryonic stage, slowly but surely ate everything up and made this feel massive, especially with Nakamura coming back and then fighting with AJ Styles. They lost their shit with that. Logically, so did I. Not just that, 
You had Styles taking the ballsiest bump of the match, follow, falling off the bloody briefcase fixing. That was incredible. I thought he bloody hurt himself. I'm hoping he didn't. But seriously, <laughs> seriously, for all of it to end, much like its predecessor, as Corbin just pushed them away and walked up the ladder without looking like he'd actually been through the match at all and strolling around triumphantly, it just ruined what this match had built up to. And I didn't like that at all. This match had the ingredients for a great contest, and while they were in place, I needed more story and less momentum shifting and a little more speed just to ensure that I didn't feel tired in places and by the end of it, a wrestler who won looked like he just strolled in there, grabbed the briefcase and walked off much like Ellsworth did. It didn't make any sense and honestly, it just felt really, really tired considering it had all the time in the world to make itself worth it. However, for all of six men's efforts here, these six men did a good job and it showed it was still a very enjoyable match to watch, making this quite tough pay-per-view end on a good note. It did all it needed to do and lived up to the hype just about. And of course, the physicality as well of the matches it has had in the past. Now, despite its flaws, this was exciting enough and had enough going on in it for me to award it three stars. It was the best match of the night, no question, allowing me to reflect on this show with some positivity as I look back into my final thoughts of this year's Money in the Bank pay-per-view. As you all may be aware, Money in the Bank didn't cash in well last night. It felt more like a bungled robbery with a decent escape plan than a well-prepared heist. The minimal card on paper obviously didn't help, as the limited SmackDown roster reared its discrepancies once again. While Raw has a massive roster, they rarely ever use the most of it despite having more minutes on a weekly television show. And I would appreciate some of that talent coming over here to bulk out the blue brand as they showcased limited resources that they had to string together a card with two multi-person matches on it, and with a lack of excitement after a month or two of average shows, it helped highlight just how poor this card was, despite the talent's best efforts to craft a passable show from it. It wasn't great, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't average either. It's a show that for me lacked stable and concise booking, which left the crowd uninterested despite some good loud voices on occasion, while I sat there just pondering how they were going to fill all of that time up. And while three matches gave enough for me to be satisfied with, to have two zeros on a modern wrestling card is unacceptable, while one of the marquee matches alongside it failed to deliver two. It left me in quite a sour mood as this card did its barest of minimums and took its sweet time to do it. I had enough good quality bouts to cover for its weaknesses in creative and talent, but at the same time made it alarmingly clear how destitute the brand is as a result of them. While the debuts of Mike Bennett and Maria Kanellis, alongside the hilarious fashion vice segment, bridged the gap nicely to ensure the lack of matches didn't burden the night overall, this was still a massive problem, and a show that I came out of disappointed when I expected to be surprised. SmackDown didn't have to do much here, but it's apparent they need a talent injection from somewhere, or they could run out of programs and meaningful matches before the summer is out, and if that continues, we could be looking at a similarly below par set of pay-per-views to come. Overall, Money in the Bank 2017 scored quite badly, a total of 3.25 out of 10. Now, it did enough to not be tarred with a extreme dirty brush that other pay-per-views in really bad situations have gotten, which would have been horrible given the weather we've had the last few days, it would have felt and smelt horrible, but it still stunk enough on its own to not deserve a lot of glowing praise from me. Now while the top of SmackDown's roster is full of potential and quality, the rest of its roster and talent pool will probably doom their future cards to fail if they don't bolster that talent pool soon. Now the addition of Mike Bennett and Maria Kanellis is a start. But if creative don't get off their asses and start doing something, by the autumn, we could be feeling very blue indeed, but for different reasons entirely, because we could run out of good pay-per-views and matches on that front. Maybe if WWE didn't hold a pay-per-view for each brand every single month, meaning we had a pay-per-view every two weeks, maybe those stories that you have problems developing would actually have time to manifest themselves into something good and not rushed. Is that an interesting idea? Oh yeah. All I know though, is that I've seen the worst pay-per-view of the year thus far, and while we still have a long way to go until 2017 ends, on WWE's current run of form, 
we could be seeing similar quality shows for the rest of this year if they don't pick up the pace soon. And Raw, you have Joe versus Lesnar. That match on its own will sell the horribly named Great Balls of Fire to me, but you need to give me an undercard worth my time or this show that is coming up much like Money in the Bank here could flounder and be very, very disappointing. Raw, let's hope you can pull an Extreme Rules instead and make me happier than I've been on this show. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The Money in the Bank 2017 review is done, and I am getting the hell out of here because I've been recording this for nearly two and a half hours, and knowing the heat that has been around here today, I am going to look and smell utterly horrible. But you get your review out on the Monday after the show, and that is what matters. I am ensuring that I get these pay-per-views out on time, whatever the weather except for the occasional thunderstorm, because that'll be bad for everybody. Now, what did you all think about this show? Do you agree that it wasn't the best show in the world, but still had its moment? Do you think it was amazing? Do you think it's the worst show of all time that so many have called it? Lord knows if you think that's the case. But anyway, if you put all your opinions in the comment section, I'll be glad to read them. And if you want to get more wrestling videos in the Friday flashback coming up later this week in One Night Only 97, which should be great, and the Great Balls of Fire review coming up at the beginning of July, and of course, many other things that this channel does. And we do a lot of it. Just go check it all out on the main link down below. And of course, if you want to keep up with everything, click the subscribe button. I'll be glad to hear about it and appreciate it your support. Also, if you want to keep up with everything that happens, including opinions and stuff, go to Twitter at CCNetworkYT to ensure you do not miss out on anything, and also check out the schedule when videos get posted. Right, I'm done. I'm getting the hell out of here. It's way too hot to be recording. And I hope you guys all remember this important tip. Ensure your room is well ventilated, because it's not going to be good. And speaking of which, make sure you ventilate your talent roster, WWE. Then I mean that, Raw. Because SmackDown bloody needs it. And I hope you heed this call. Because if you don't, SmackDown is going to keep going downhill. And if that's Vince's idea of growth, he is one twisted bastard of a businessman. I have been Freddie Thomas. You and people listening. This has been the Money in the Bank 2017 pay-per-view review for the CC Network. And I will see you all next time.